Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, it's quite an exciting day. I hope you will enjoy this. Um, I was I set myself for a pretty much impossible mission, which is to give you a complete overview of what's going on in uh, Hyperledger land. And so I will start with talking about what's going on with the TSC itself, and then give you a little bit of a test of what's going on in all the different projects, working groups, etc. So without further ado, you know, let's start with the TSC itself. Um, so the work we do is kind of trying to manage all the different projects, all the different activities that are happening from a technical point of view and give everybody some kind of, you know, organization structure. So we have a clear process on how, you know, a project go through different phases of maturity and so on. So we actually have a decision log that we maintain. And when issues come up, they get added to the decision log, obviously. And then um, we, we, we try to solve them and improve the overall organization. And so one important decision we took a very year ago is when we Hyperledger just started with a fairly so small number of projects, uh, we had a technical steering committee with nine people. Uh, it became pretty clear that, you know, after five years, given the number of projects we had, we needed to have a bigger TSC to have better representation, more diversity. And so we actually changed to 15 seats. And I think it was a very successful transition because we effectively have much more diversity now, both in terms of actual gender, but also in representation of the different projects within Hyperledger. We have a project life cycle that, uh, project go through, they start in incubation, and then we had this thing called active status when, you know, project had grown up into an uh, active community with uh, clearly defined processes, CI and whatnot. And this term was always confusing. And we actually borrowed from the CNCF, uh, the, 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 the term graduated instead. It's a fairly small change, but we hope that this will actually clarify what this is about. And so we renamed the active status to graduated. And so um, hopefully this will be clear because it's about the status of the community and how the project behave. And there are plenty of projects in incubation that are very active. So hopefully that will clarify this. Um, we removed the requirement to have a lab sponsor. So labs is an environment we created several years ago to help uh, provide uh, an, an area where people could actually experiment with new projects, uh, start building a community, maybe around a project that has been going on for a while, but is not necessarily known publicly. And uh, the idea was, you know, the, the, the process to go through an approval to create a project is pretty heavy because there's quite a bit of resources invested by Hyperledger into projects. And so having a lab space where the, the bar to creating a lab is much, much lower and you don't need TSC approval, you just go ahead and create one and you can start working. And there was this notion of sponsor we had put on this. But, you know, it seemed to be actually a barrier. This is based on actual feedback we received. So we removed this to lower the barrier to creating labs and bring in more, you know, uh, activity to the Hyperledger. And so we've done a bunch of other things like, you know, the, the Hyperledger community is fairly fragmented for historical reason because we're different projects that don't necessarily share much in common. And so, you know, one of the members submit feedback we got was, well, what can you do to try and break those silos? And so we've tried to look at different activities we could take on, one of which was to actually have people come to the TSC calls and present on their project to make them more visible and known to everybody. Uh, in terms of the project life cycle, one more change we added recently was a dormant status. There are projects sometimes that want to just take a break. And there's actually the project quilt is going through this right now. This is what prompted this. We added the dormant status, which allows project to basically self-declare, okay, we're not going to do anything for the next uh, few months. So consider dormant. It doesn't mean we're going away forever. It just means for the next few months, we are not going to do anything. So um, then we have this, you know, the new activities that we're actually looking at are more around, we are looking at a badging system, which beyond this, you know, uh, status for project, um, we're looking at something that's finer grain that would give us a better way to measure 
with the, the, the health of different projects. Uh, we've been looking at issues related to developer certificate of origin. We're always trying to, there's a trade-off between trying to, you know, provide adequate protection from an IP point of view. Uh, I am talking about intellectual property here. And uh, at the same time, not putting too much burden on the possible contribution, especially by people who are not necessarily actively contributing to Hyperledger on a daily basis. And then there's the greenhouse. I'm sure you're familiar with, this is the way we've traditionally represented all the different projects within Hyperledger. And this, hyper, this greenhouse, you know, there's a lot of feedback again we got um, was that it's actually confusing because there's all these different projects. There are actually sometimes dependencies between those projects. There's different relationships that are not surfaced through this. And so we actually have an effort in the way to look into updating the website, changing the greenhouse to something that would be easier to understand uh, for, for people. And then in parallel to that, we're actually looking at the charter, which has aged. Uh, we have evolved quite a bit of the charter, the initial charter, which actually only anticipated to have a single framework being developed. We obviously have a lot more than that today. So we're actually updating the charter. And then, you know, a big part of what we do, as I said, is manage the different projects, right? We are looking at new proposals and then uh, as projects mature, they can go through these different phases. A big one is the graduated phase that I just talked about. And uh, I'm happy to say that the ARIES project graduated this year. And uh, it's, in my opinion, one of the most qualified projects. Interestingly enough, they didn't think so, but as part of the quarterly report they give to the TSC, we prompted them to say, but why haven't you applied to graduate yet? And they said, well, we didn't know we could qualify for this. We actually kind of pushed them to look into it. And I'm happy to say that they did qualify. Their, their application went absolutely through very easily. And one of the reasons is because a big criteria for graduation is actually the, the diversity in the community. This is something that often blocks projects that would all, all, otherwise qualify. And ARIES is the most diverse project within Hyperledger. So let's move on to project updates quickly. <laughs> so as I said, so this is the list of graduated projects we have today. So as I was just talking about ARIES, um, so they actually enjoy over eight different implementations of what they call the interrupt profile version one. They have many deployment of the agent and they have actually agreed on the profile two zero spec which that will provide further uh, interoperability among the clients. Uh, in parallel, the Bezu project has been working on the Ethereum improvement proposal uh, 1559, which actually focuses on issues related to uh, gas usage. And um, this will actually be part of the release that will be uh, deployed along with the fork that will happen in Ethereum uh, in July, and uh, that will provide uh, that will make transaction costs more predictable. The Fabric project went through some major revision with one significant event where we actually moved from the long-term support uh, 1.4 branch to the 2.2 branch. So no longer, nobody should ever use 1.4 anymore. They should actually switch to the 2.2 uh, branch at the minimum. Uh, at the same time, there are more development happening in 2.3 and 2.40, which is starting to be uh, out. There was a pre-release uh, recently that uh, always brings more features to make things easier to get on board, et cetera. The Indie project uh, has been known for to run, is, there's an instance of the Indie uh, network running for the Sovereign Foundation, but there are actually two new instances that were deployed. And uh, this actually prompted the, the community to say we should define a deep method called DeepIndy that would be used by all public Indy networks. The EROA project has been going through some major rewrite as they were initially written, EROA was written in Java. And for the version two, they are rewriting it all in Rust. And they are going, to, they are approaching the, the first table preview release of that. So tooth went also through some major reorganization. They actually split Sawtooth in many different pieces, 
there is actually now a library that can be used, extracted from Sotuk itself and used by different blockchain and DLT implementations. They, at the same time, use the Transact project that we'll talk about next for transaction processing. And the Saber engine that they have in has been externalized to Transact. When it comes to projects and incubation, we have the Avalon project that has been going through some releases as well. They are actually focusing on taking advantage of new SGX capabilities. The Burrow project went through some interesting development around TypeScript code generation that makes it easier for people to deploy contracts, submit transactions, and so on. The Cactus project, which has to do with interoperability, is a move to a language agnostic plugin based architecture to make it easier to integrate different blockchain into the Cactus uh, in, uh, framework. The Caliper project has simplified this connector API also to make it easier to connect different blockchain systems into it and to also move away from a programmable system to more configuration based uh, system which is more declarative and easier to use. The Cello project is going through a redesign to make it more decentralized and more flexible. And then the Explorer project um, added support for the latest for Fabric version. This is the 2.x version as a, in addition to the 1.x version. And they also give more insight into what fab, the, is going on with the Fabric network beyond just the blockchain itself, but you can actually access information such as the endorsement policy. The grid project had a civil revision, and the latest one is actually bringing new capabilities related to uh, GS1 product definitions. The Transact project, as I was talking about earlier, has generated pieces of Sawtooth. It's used, it has actually gone through major uh, evolution that has led to uh, reduction in latency and better performance. And it is actually used both by Sotus and Splinter, which is outside of Hyperledger. Finally, the Ursa project, which is a cryptographic library, uh, had a major release in December, and they are going through some major re reorganization of the code, I should say. Initially, it was based around some projected usage. And now that they have, you know, had a bit more experience with how people really use the library, they are reorganizing the library to make it better fitted to what, how people actually use it. So this is for all the projects, but Hyperledger is not limited to those projects. We also have a lot of working groups. So there is an architecture working group, which actually went through a quiet phase and is just relaunching with an interoperability discussion that we'll talk more about next. Uh, we have the diversity, civility, and inclusion working group that developed a whole bunch of recommendations to you know, be used across the Hyperledger. I know that they are meeting still regularly. They have a fairly low attendance. I encourage people if they are inclined and interested in kind of topic to look into it and join. We have the Learning Material Development Working Group, which is led by the amazing Bobby Muscara, who has a lot of energy and actually manages to get their group to help people basically, you know, literally on board uh, in Hyperledger, find their ways through all the different projects that I'm talking about. And they actually maintain a page which gives you kind of like everything you need to know about what's happening to the, today or this week in, in, the, in Hyperledger. So it's an amazing piece of resource. I encourage you to look into it. The Performance and Scalability Working Group also went through a quiet phase and is actually looking into relaunching. They are discussing what they are going to do exactly. And then we have the Technical Working Group in China, which really is uh, designed so that there is such an activity uh, around uh, blockchain in China. You know, they felt like they need to have some kind of group where they could get together and talk. They work on many different aspects, and it's a great uh, piece of uh, uh, Hyperledger that is worth mentioning. So now I want to talk a little bit more about interoperability specifically. And if you look at the program for this conference, you'll see interoperability appears quite a bit. I really think that interoperability is becoming a hot topic in the blockchain space. And it's, you know, especially for the kind of blockchain we do, which is permission networks. And essentially we're building a lot of islands 
And from the very early on, people started saying, okay, but once we have built all these islands, are we in, in, uh, how are we going to connect them? And I can tell you, I also work with a lot of standards organization. They, was, they were always asking me, oh no, should we start a standard? And I was like, wait, wait, it's way too early. We're just still trying to develop the technology, give us a chance. But I do think now, maybe it's the time for interoperability. And for proof of the interest in this, just looking at Hyperledger, we have actually three different efforts. There's the Cactus Project, which actually started with two different uh, efforts uh, from Accenture and Fujitsu. But we also have two labs that were recently started, one from IB by IBM, one by DataChain. And so they all take different approaches to that very problem. What are we talking about? Just to give you a very quick intro, and again, there are full sessions on data on this topic. I encourage you to attend to know more. But the three main cases for interoperability in blockchain are uh, data transfer. This is essentially being able to query some data from one network to another and being able to verify the validity of this data. There is asset exchange. This is Imagine you have a, on a network, you're managing ownership of assets. On another, you do payments and you want to sell the asset. So you want to basically pair the asset ownership exchange on one network with the payment on the other. And you need to make sure that those two transactions either fail or happen together. You can't have one or the other. And then there is asset transfer across networks. This is actually moving an asset from one network to another, ensuring obviously that you're not losing the asset in between or you're not creating asset of, out of thin air. So there's all these activities going on and I personally got interested and looked into it and started asking people, so how does that work? How does this compare to this other approach and stuff? And it became very quickly clear to me that there was a lot of misunderstanding of what each approach really entailed. And so we started the discussion, which is now hosted by the Architecture Working Group, which aims at defin defining, de actually developing a document that will give us a comparison of these different approaches. And the idea is that once we have actually developed a common understanding, we can then talk about possibly what we could do in terms of collaborations between these different projects. Moving on quickly to Hyperledger Labs. So Hyperledger Labs, as I said, are not under the governance of TSE, but they actually are the biggest source of innovation and new work within Hyperledger, which is why I think it's very important to look into it. There is tremendous amount of activity happening in Hyperledger Labs, and I really invite you to look into it. I give you some numbers here, and I tried to get through the list the other day and kind of define big high-level categories of where I thought these different projects uh, uh, fell. And you can see, you know, it's a very broad set of, uh, of topics. Uh, just to name a few at the very end, you know, of my list there, we have two new labs that just got uh, launched recently uh, that actually is Firefly and Fabric Smart Client to name them. And they actually, I think, take a hyperledger to a completely new set of uh, 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 topics because it's moving up the stack. So far, we spend all of time basically working at the framework level, at this fairly low level plumbing. And in fact, when you look and talk to people who actually develop applications, you realize there's a lot more to it than the, the blockchain itself. And those efforts are trying to move us up into this land that sits on top of the framework and try to be closer to the business developer and looking into what is going to be going to take to develop an application, provide APIs that are much higher level. So again, I encourage you to look into this. So the TSC, to finish on this, I'm trying to look back to my topic in the first place, is, you know, officially our mission is to define what gets done and how it gets done. Of course, you know, we are trying to be fairly lightweight. Um, we try to leave as much freedom as possible to the project, all the while giving them, you know, a proper structure so that it can effectively work and that we have some consistency across the different projects. But so the TSC is very open. We have weekly calls. We, you know, there are 15 members, as I said, but we often have 30 or more people join. I invite you to, to join our call. The project calls are announced 
and um, the, I always post the agenda beforehand. I invite everybody to come in and join us. So there is a mailing list and to finish, I'm out of time. Uh, I invite you to get involved. The TSC is not happening out of thin air. We're all members of the technical community. Everybody who is involved in the technical work qualifies to nominate themselves for the election. We will have a new election in the fall and I encourage you to nominate yourself and if not, to at least participate and vote. Thank you very much. Have a good event. Wow. Thank you so much, Arno. Um, you know, listening to you talk and give these overviews is kind of like wearing a jetpack and hovering over Disneyland and seeing all of the great stuff happening all over Disneyland. I know Fantasyland is being remodeled and there's a new ride over here. Um, it's overwhelming, but hopefully it helps give people a sense that there's so much dynamicism to the community and it's, uh, you know, so much more than any one project or any one approach. Uh, it really is a, a really diverse ecosystem. And so lots of places for, uh, for folks interested to, to start climbing in and get engaged. Thank you so much.